Thank you for coming, everybody. We're going to take one more minute before we get started, okay? Right. Okay, I think we're gonna get started. Um, oh, uh, one second. I think a few people are asking, uh, trying to get into another Zoom. Um, that's the residency one. You guys all ask that. Okay. All right. Um, all right, we can get started. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining our first FlyMed Medical School Application Workshop. My name is Joanna and I will be modulating the session today. It is my pleasure to do it. Before we get started, we wish to recognize and add our full support to the national strike that is happening today, uh, shut down academia and shut down STEM. We recognize the role that academia and academic medicine play in being complicit in systems that devalue black individuals. We hope that each of us will spend some time today reflecting, educating, and acting to initiate the process of dismantling these systems within academia and our broader society. As FLY students, we face distinct challenges in the process of applying to medical school, especially given the recent events in the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, this workshop aims to address topics and concerns specific to FLY pre-med students during medical school application. This workshop will last for about two hours and consist of a faculty speaking series and student panel. The first session will be recorded and the student panel will not be. We're gonna take a small five minute break in between. In our first session, we have three amazing faculty speakers addressing topics specific to medical school application as FLY students. We have a lot of exciting things to go through today, so we ask everyone to hold on to your questions during the talks, and at the very end of the talk series, we're gonna have about 15 minutes for questions. The three amazing faculty speakers we have with us today are Dean Megan Rigney from Columbia University, Dr. Sunny Nakai from University of California Riverside School of Medicine, and Dr. Darren Lattimore from Yale School of Medicine. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dean Rigney. Dean Rigney is the Associate Dean of Pre-Professional Advising and Academic Support at Columbia University. Dean Regney has been advising pre-health students for over 20 years, 18 of those years at Columbia University. In that time, she had helped thousands of students prepare for their applications to medical school. Dean Regney's advising philosophy is centered on the idea that every applicant is an individual with distinct background, personal narrative, and individual path. She believes it is her job to encourage and empower students to discover their strength and recognize their vulnerabilities so that they may work towards becoming the most prepared applicants that they can be. She is passionate about this work, for not only does she get to help students realize their dreams, 
but is proud of the small role that she plays in developing a more diverse and inclusive healthcare workforce. Please join me to welcome Dean Rigney. Thank you so much, Joanna. I'm gonna just go ahead and share my, just a couple of slides. Oh, I'm having some difficulty. So try one more time. Hmm. Okay, I'm just gonna go go it alone without the screen share. That works for everyone because it doesn't seem to be letting me do that. So thank you so much. The first thing I wanted to say was thank you so much um, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I want to start by saying that I think peer mentorship is super important um, as you go forward in this journey. And so it's really great to learn of this organization fly and the important work that it's doing. So um, I'm really excited to, to be here today. However, I know you heard um, from my colleague, Dr. Hilder Hudserson, uh, yesterday as your keynote speaker, and she's a little bit hard to follow. Uh, she has a really great story, and um, I know because she's spoken to students of, of ours at the undergraduate campus um, many times and has just been really inspirational and motivational. So I'll do my best to try to give you some good information, but uh, just know I, I can't compete with Dr. Hutcherson. So I was asked today to try to address um, best practices for application from my perspective as a, as a pre-health advisor. And so I just wanna cover some Quick tips. Um, I know some of you are probably in the application process now. Um, some are looking forward to application next year or uh, at a subsequent year. So I'm going to try to, to address very specific things about the application, but also more broad themes to help you along with your journey. So the first point I wanted to make is that um, I think it's most important to become informed. And I know as first generation students, you are, it's been in my experience that first generation students are very resourceful and self-reliant and are great at, um, at really becoming informed um, of knowing their resources and getting out there and finding the information. And I think that's the first step in the, uh, in the application process and even in preparing um, for an application process is to know the facts. What are the steps to prepare for this career? What do medical schools value? How might you build the competencies that are required? And I think that there's, you know, you're, you're on the right um, path because you're here today and this is one of the things that you should be um, availing yourself of, of organizations like these and, and mentors that have come before you that will really help you along your path. You also, you know, just want to get online and research online. Um, be careful about what you read online. Not everything uh, on the internet is true. And I think that that's true of some of the pre-med forums that are out there. So I always caution students to be careful about that. But the AAMC has some great information. Um, there's great information um, uh, on other websites. Uh, the medical schools themselves have wonderful websites and information. So spend some time, you know, just getting to know the places that you might be interested in online. Read books. Um, there's some wonderful books that are out there written by physicians and other healthcare providers that will really help you to become informed about um, healthcare as a system, um, about this profession that you're hoping to join, and I think it will continue to motivate you. Connect to others, whether that is pre-med advisors like myself, other med medical students, um, alumni of your institution that have gone before you, other advisors, physicians in your community, um, anyone that you can that can really help you to, um, uh, to be informed about the profession. Um, 
The, ne the next the point I'd like to make is, is don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, again, I think uh, first gen students tend to be pretty independent and self-reliant, but this is a, is a time not to do it alone. Um, really find those trusted sources of information and, and reach out for help, reach out for guidance. Uh, you know, sometimes your friend who applied last year might ha might be helpful to you in some capacity, but remember that their experience is different than your own and they might not have, um, what worked for them might not work for you. And so I always encourage you to, to think about finding an advisor who has a broader perspective, has worked with students, um, countless students that, that can help you to find the right path for you. I mean, also look for specific help that might be available on your campus, whether that is uh, our pre-med societies. If you're in the application process right now, the writing center at your institution might be helpful in, re in reviewing your personal statement. The career center might be able to, to give you a mock interview um, if you're you know, sort of worried about going off for, for interviewing. The academic support center might be helpful to you in, in the early stages by providing tutoring and or study skills support. Um, really, you know, avail yourself of all your resources. You're paying, you know, sort of expensive tuition wherever it is that you're in college and those resources are there to, to assist you and to guide you. And so be sure to, to know what they are and to reach out. The fellowships office is another great um, resource if you're looking for something to do in your time between. They also, sometimes there's some fellowships, summer fellowships, they can help with funding opportunities. So, um, you know, check out those areas within your own campus community. You might also find a mentor um, through your, your faculty. So don't be afraid to go to office hours, to um, get to know the people that are teaching your classes, tell them about yourself, tell them about your goals. You never know where that you know, expertise might um, come or that next you know, connection that leads you to a great research opportunity or an internship that you're really interested in. So be sure to connect to lots of different people on your campus to um, ask for help and, and to, uh, to assist you. I think sometimes, um, I know one of the questions I was asked was to identify um, how to, to get advising if you don't have a pre-health advisor on your campus. And I know that, that the advising can be uneven across um, college campuses. And sometimes I think students we are afraid to go to see their pre-med advisor. They're afraid that they're gonna get discouraged um, or they're gonna be told that they can't do it or that their, um, their grades aren't good enough. And I think that's a terrible thing, and I am really sorry if any one of you have experienced that, but um, you know, don't be afraid if you haven't gone to see a pre-health advisor. You know, we are really in the, it's our job to help you, and it's our goal to help you to, to find the path that's right for you to get to where you're going. Um, it's okay if you don't have a perfect record. We don't expect you to have a perfect record. And um, we want to help you to figure out the way forward with, um, you know, whatever your interests are and, and whatever your timeline is. So please don't be um, afraid or discouraged um, and think that, that we aren't there to help you because um, we are. I think the other thing that I like to say about students in the application process is start early and submit early. Start early with your planning and that comes from, you know, sort of preparing for this application and that, you know, sort of sometimes is years before you're actually at that stage where you're going to hit the submit button. But also during your application phase, you know, really make a plan of when do I hope to take my MCAT, um, when will I hope to submit my application, um, when will I ask for those letters of recommendation? When do I hope to finish my secondaries? If you set these milestones for yourself, you will really be more organized and, and potentially make a little bit more progress. But also be flexible with that plan. So as we're seeing this year, COVID-19 has interrupted and disrupted lots of people's plans um, for this application process. And we are all being forced to be flexible and this year will be different than uh, many others. And the timelines will be a little different. And there's going to be more flexibility. 
um, because we all have to live with canceled MCAT uh, test dates and you know plans that the internships that didn't happen or gap year jobs that aren't starting. And I think that everyone in the community um, really understands this and really just wants students to be able to um, fulfill these applications and get to medical school because we certainly need um, healthcare providers more than ever right now and really motivated healthcare providers. So again, if your plans have, you know, sort of been disrupted, don't stress out about that. You know, we really feel that um, you're going to be able to reach your goals. And even if you're not able to, you know, take your MCAT until August or September, just work on the other pieces of your application and, and try to submit those so that you've got the ball rolling and, and things are happening. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is to, in this application process is to be authentic and to tell your story. Um, you don't want to try to fit yourself into a box that you somehow think medical schools want you to be in. Admissions committees are really looking for authentic individuals with individual interests and passions. They want to learn about your unique backstory, your strengths, the challenges that you have um, gone through, and your individual motivations for this career. The hope is that um, everyone coming to medical school will have those individual interests and it will be a dynamic community of learning from one another. And so really, truly be authentic to your own story and to your own um, experience. Remember that your life experiences really do matter. You know, beyond what's on your resume, just what you've experienced in your families and in um, your life experience is important. And you want to, to celebrate that and to tell the admissions committees about that. Um, you know, if you worked at Domino's to help you to fund, a delivering pizza to help you to fund your college tuition or your expenses, tell them about that. If you helped your mom by babysitting your younger siblings and, you know, had to go home on weekends to be able to do that or commuted to school because of that, tell them about that. All of those things are important because they, each of the experiences that you have are learning experiences and show the admissions committee something about um, your character. So again, everything that, that is in your application doesn't have to directly relate to healthcare or medicine. There are many experiences that you've had in your life that are really valuable, that have taught you a ton that you're gonna then use in your future career as a healthcare provider. Um, so just reflect on those experiences and, and really try to, to tell that story. I also talked about, you know, sort of in my bio, this idea that I want to empower you to understand your strengths. And I'm going to um, really challenge you this afternoon after you leave this session to go, um, you know, and sit by yourself and write down what you think your five um, strengths are, you know, your, your, your largest strengths. Um, I often see students come to me and they're very easily able to identify their weaknesses. Tell me what all of their weaknesses are, the things that they can't do or haven't done well. Um, but it, they don't always celebrate their strengths. And if you don't know what your strengths are and if you're struggling with that, go ask one of your friends or go ask um, a, a family member or a mentor or someone else who can tell you and help you to identify those. Because it's your job to, to really celebrate those and to bring them forward so the admissions committee can see those things. Um, it's also important to know your, your vulnerabilities and your weaknesses. We all have um, the things that we're good at and the, the things that we're working on. And I think medical schools want to see you as a learner. They want to see you as someone who's interested in growing and is someone who's self-reflective and can, can identify the areas that they want to improve and have a plan to, to work on them and that um, are, are not afraid um, to be honest about that and to talk about what they're doing to, to improve on those strengths. So um, don't be afraid to, to, to you know, sort of bring that forward as well. Um, the, the other thing that I've been asked to, to sort of talk about is um, when you know you're ready to be uh, to prepared to, to be a competitive applicant. And I think I spend a lot of time um, talking to my advisees about this, is um, really helping them to be self-reflective and doing an assessment um, of when they're ready. 
and your readiness, it, you know, spans a lot of different areas. It, it might, your academic preparation and, and readiness is one area. Um, and one of the, the sources that you can use if you're applying to allopathic medical school is the Medical School Admissions Requirements Guide, the MSAR, and it can help you to see um, sort of each individual medical school and what their profiles look like and, and what the, some of the numbers look like, how many applicants they have, how many they interviewed, was the in-state versus out-of-state, what are the median GPAs and, and MCAT scores. Um, and sometimes looking at those numbers can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, and, I, and I encourage you to know that the, the, you know, to, that the median is just that, it's the median. They also present the 10th to the 90th percentile of, of GPA and MCAT numbers. And I think that's what you should pay more attention to, is sort of what that, that range looks like. You don't have to be at the median. You can be in the lower range of one you know, score or the other. Maybe it's your MCAT that you're in a lower range. You have a really great GPA or the opposite. You know, remember that you have a lot more to bring to this application process than, than just your, your, um, your stats, right? It's a holistic uh, review process and the medical schools are really interested to know what else you're bringing. They want to make sure you're successful and, they, and that you're not an academic risk and, and will, because the worst thing that they want to do is bring you on and you have difficulty in the, in the program. But beyond that, they're really more interested in the other qualities that you bring forward and that's going to come through from the activities that you've been involved in through your letters of recommendation, through your interview, through your personal statement. Um, and, and that often is, is way more important once you get through that sort of, you know, um, screening process. So don't get overwhelmed by, by the numbers, but, but know where you stand, because if you need to do a little bit more preparation, you need to retake your MCAT, um, you want it to do that, right? You want to put yourself in the best position to be successful and to be the most competitive applicant that you can be. And I always say with the MCAT, you don't want this one little exam to define, you know, all uh, your application when you've worked so hard to really prepare and be um, prepared in all other areas. And it's, you know, it's seven and a half hours, or maybe this year it's five and a half hours. Um, but, it, you know, it, it it's something that you can can do again um, if you need to and, and really find some additional resources to help you to be successful. You also want to think about your clinical exposure and your demonstrated commitment. So have you had the opportunity to really test your motivation? Can you answer the question, um, why do you want to go to medical school? Why do you want to be in medicine? Do you have some concrete examples that will help you to illustrate that through some of your patient-centered um, experiences? Um, can you reflect on sort of the, not only the, the rewards of medicine and what you think is going to be great about it, but some of the challenges that you may have seen, um, some of the, the gaps that we have in our healthcare system, some of the disparities that exist. Can you talk about those? Can you um, talk about what you want to do um, to maybe address some of those things? What space that you want to live in that, that will make the profession better? And I think if you, if you reflect on that and you feel that you have um, really strong answers to those, then, then you're ready, right? Then you have the, that demonstrated commitment and you have some of those experiences that are, are going to help you. Do you have leadership and teamwork? Have you worked with other um, individuals toward common goals? Healthcare is a team endeavor. And so they're looking for students that know how to both be a leader, but also a good team member. So thinking about your experiences there. And then finally, I think, is this the right timing for you sort of in your life outside of all your pre-med world, right? So um, do you have family responsibilities that are important for you to take care of during this time? Do you, are you able to step away and really fully um, dig into not only at the application process, but eventually medical school? Uh, you know, financial obligations, are you, are you ready to um, take this on? Hopefully, I think the other thing that I, I forgot to um, mention earlier is best practice for your application is apply for fee assistance. Um, if you qualify, get the documentation together, you know, it really, it's a huge asset to have 20 free medical schools to apply to, um, to get a lot of free MCAT resources, to, to get free other free resources, to have your secondary application fees waived. 
apply for fee assistance, I cannot stress that enough. Um, this year they've expanded fee assistance um, for allopathic medical schools and we're really you know, happy that that's occurring, especially given the COVID-19 you know, sort of financial implications for many individuals and families. And the final thing that I wanted to, to leave with you with, and, and maybe I can um, share this in the chat uh, a little bit later in terms of some, uh, uh, like a specific resource, but for those of you who don't have a pre-med advisor on your campus or haven't been able to locate that person, there's a National Association of Advisors of the Health Professions that has a volunteer um, army of advisors who are there for um, those of you who don't have pre-med advisors on your campus or have left your campus and your campus doesn't um, you know serve alumni and they you know and, and it's just an email that you would send um, and you can get connected with a, a seasoned um, pre-health advisor either who's still working in their own um, university or retired who can really work closely with you and answer those questions so i'll share that a little bit later um, in the chat but i think also you know in the larger sense you know finding an advisor it might not be a person that has an official title of pre-health advisor but it might be another type of mentor. It could be um, someone like Dean Hutcherson. I send lots of people up to Dean Hutcherson to, to talk about their experiences. It can be you know, another mentor that you've, you've identified um, through the experiences that you've had. Just find someone that is willing to be a support for you and to, to sort of work with you through this process. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much, Dean Regni, for all these helpful suggestions that you, uh, that you went through. And I think some of them that I took notes down, like asking for help and then celebrate our flat background really resonates with uh, what Dr. Hutchison uh, mentioned yesterday as well. So thank you, really. Um, all right, and then our next speaker uh, is Dr. Nikai. Um, Dr. Nikai is the Health Sciences Associated Clinical Professor in the Department of Social Medicine, Population, and Public Health in the Division of Clinical Sciences and the Associate Dean for Student Affairs at the University of California, Riverside School of Medicine. Dr. Nikai previously served as Associate Assistant Dean for Admissions, Recruitment, and Student Life and Assistant Professor of Medical Education at Loyola University Chicago Stretch School of Medicine. Dr. Nikai works with national organizations to advocate for access and equity in higher education for undocumented, underrepresented, minoritized, and marginalized students and trainees. She's known for her expertise in mission-driven, holistic admissions and holistic review processes. In her new book, Pre-Med Prep, Dr. Nikkei also draws from her many years of experience as medical school admissions dean to offer wise and compassionate advice that can help pre-med students of all backgrounds, with specific tips for students who are first generation, minority, non-traditional, and undocumented. Please join me to welcome Dr. Nikkei. Thank you so much, Joanna, for that lovely introduction. I'm really happy to be um, joining the group today and super passionate about supporting students on their journeys. And I wanna thank um, Dean Rigney for all that really great advice. Um, it's so wonderful to have advisors out there. And actually it's part of the advice that I give in my book is to work with your premium advisors. So um, I wanna start by talking about something that I think is important. And that is that there's so much diversity in the experiences of first-gen students. And um, I talk about this in my book a lot because I wanna understand um, that resource, resource shortages come in lots of different forms, um, knowledge, support, um, emotional, material. And so um, understanding that um, even as a group, as much solidarity as we have, we have to continue to create that space for um, the diversity within experience that students often have. And our identities overlap and intersect with our experiences as first-gen students. Um, and I just really want to uh, acknowledge that right now. I also want to acknowledge um, the importance of especially medicine and medicine's consciousness to understanding Black Lives Matter and that that's important. Um, and so I think I would be remiss if I didn't just mention that and want to affirm that, that ways that we work to dismantle oppression in our society are about our own liberation ultimately. So um, 
one of the most important things for first generation students that I think is important is learning boundaries. And this is something that um, in working with several students over the years is just really challenging. Um, coming from families that operate with collective mindsets or very different norms of working together, um, sometimes I think boundaries are challenging. And in undergrad, I had students that were not able to continue because their family's financial challenges became their financial challenges. They used their financial aid to help a sibling or you know, to cover costs or to cover bills and ultimately took away from their ability to move forward. And these are some of the most difficult, um, I think sometimes challenges for those of us who are pioneers is trying to understand our own goals and our own ways forward um, and what our remaining responsibility and connection is to our, our families of origin and our communities of origin that we take with us um, in certain ways. So I think, you know, learning how to say no or understanding um, we're not obligated to light ourselves on fire to keep other people warm. Um, and it's hard because oftentimes there's real suffering and there's real challenges. And I have been on the phone with a student who said, my brother's asking to live with me. He can't leave jail. He's on supervision. He needs to put down an address. Like, can I just, you know, should I have my brother come with me? It's going to violate my lease because I'm not allowed to do that. And, you know, it's a hard decision to say, I can't put my housing on the line when someone in my family, you know, needs that, if I'm going to move forward and even make a difference and be a strong resource for someone in my family in the future, I have to continue to persist and, and have those boundaries. And um, some of those losses uh, are, and, and hardships are very real. And some of them, the most challenging ones, don't just involve what we have to overcome. It involves just the journey itself and some of those um, friction points that happen um, when we have to enact boundaries to continue our path forward. Um, I have many colleagues who are first generation that relate to this a lot and can say that they are very glad that they persisted and got to a place where they can powerfully give back um, without, you know, endangering their own well-being um, or compromising uh, their own goals. And, and that's, that's really hard. And, and I'm a first gen student and my background was that I really only had kind of those barriers to overcome. I didn't actually begin with as much of a deficit as some of the students that I've shared journeys with um, in terms of my family of origin or other aspects um, that make being a first-gen student so difficult. So I wanted to make sure and, and really address that and acknowledge that for the group because I, I do think that it's important that our barriers come in, in many different forms and are incredibly intersectional with, um, with our roots. Um, the second thing is really to talk about advice on advice. So seeking advice, you know, I was a first-gen student who asked a lot of questions and just reached out and tried to connect with as many people as I could. And that's been my approach to a lot of my challenges in life is to try and build a network as much as possible. But sometimes it can be difficult to discern advice. Um, in my family, for example, I'm the only one who kind of has a professional career. And so I get asked all the questions that have anything to do with professional anything. Well, Sunny went to college, so she must be able to answer this legal question. And I'm like, actually, I'm not an attorney. Like, oh, Sunny works in medical school. She'll understand like this med medical issue. Actually, I'm not a physician. Like, so, but for my family, like the threshold is sort of like, you know, there's where their, you know, mindset is. And then there's sort of like the sky of everything else that I must somehow magically know, right? So. So I think um, learning to distinguish um, what makes someone a good advice, how to decide like what advice is relevant. And um, the best tip that I can give you is that it's proximal to how much you believe a person cares about you, um, the level of advice that you might be able to accept. Will this person, um, can I get the same piece of advice from another person who's deemed an expert? Can I evaluate this person's expertise and opinion? Um, as Dean Rigney said, not everything you read on, you know, online forums are true, right? And we don't know the sources of those things. They may not be evidence-based. Um, there may be other motivations for people posting things in those forums. And so learning how to really determine good advice, you know, and build those relationships is, is an important um, skill. So I definitely think that working with advisors and using our campus resources is really important um, and being savvy in that. And I will follow up um, to what was already said is that you're already paying for those resources. So if um, you bought 50 pairs of shoes and you only wear two, it's kind of dumb because you already paid for the other 48. So you might as well put them on. 
check it out. I don't know if I need tutoring, but I should go to the tutoring center and see what they have, right? So there's so many resources that are there because they're responding to student need over time. You're not the first college student to be on campus. And at UCR, I know we have our pantry for food and basic needs. We have our closet for professional clothing. Um, we do have a career center, we have a library. I mean, we have so many amazing, you know, our counseling center is amazing and is now doing, doing visits virtually. So all of those things are for your betterment. Um, and learn to see resources as a way to enhance your path and your well-being rather than a tool to respond to something that's gone wrong, right? So resources as a college student are like preventive maintenance on your car. You don't wait until you completely run out of oil and you broke down on the side of the road to get your oil checked or change the oil, right? We, we do that periodically to make sure that we can keep running and that we're optimizing performance, right? So sometimes because we're managing so many things at once, we're only responding to crises. And when we get into crisis response mode, we're only looking for resources for the things that we think are the most acutely wrong, rather than asking, what do I need to thrive? And how can I seek resources that are gonna help me do that? So work based on your vision for yourself thriving, not as a response to what you have to do just to survive, because you deserve to thrive and you belong on campus, just like everyone else does. Um, the, the caveat to working with your advisor um, is also, if you don't feel that that person is supportive of you or your direct interactions with them feel discouraging, find another advisor, find another person that's willing to help you. But don't say all advisors are bad. I'm never going to talk to another advisor again, because that's obviously not fair. And you might miss out on working with a great advisor like Dean Rigney or me or, you know, Dean Lattimore, people who will actually be able to help you. So if you find someone and they don't give you that great of advice or it doesn't feel supportive, keep searching and, and move on to the, the next thing. Um, all of us should have a panel of advisors that we can work with to help us with different things, right? Maybe the writing center doesn't know specifically about personal statements for medical school. Maybe they know about grammar. Maybe they know a little bit about composition. Maybe they can help you make the flow better, help you work on a thesis statement for your personal statement, right? So not every person is gonna be exactly the fit for what you need, but you can piece all those experts together for your benefit. Um, I wanna say one more thing because I wanna leave time. Um, the stress of COVID-19 and everything that's been going on um, and how to handle that um, in, as an applicant during this cycle, I think the biggest thing is to advocate for yourself and to make sure that if you're applying to a school late because of your MCAT, reach out to that school and ask how much consideration you might receive. Be willing to be flexible um, with your resources and your timelines according to what um, flexibility schools might be offering. And unfortunately, that means kind of contacting the schools and finding out what makes sense. I will send, um, FlyMed, the information on some pre-med chats I'm doing. I'm doing three pre-med chats once a month um, just to answer questions and to try to be out there as a resource for students a little bit more so that um, I have a chance to, to get your questions and answer your questions and then I'll try and record those and, and post them um, on YouTube so that you'll have access to like a lot of the common questions that students ask and what the answers to those are. So those are free and, and you're welcome um, to join. Um, it's the second Sunday of, of every month um, between now and 2021, and um, I'll, I'll send that information to join to share with you if you'd like. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Nakai, for the ins uh, for the inspiring words. Um, next, we have Dr. Lattimore. Dr. Lattimore is the Deputy Dean for Diversity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer at Yale School of Medicine. He is responsible for developing a comprehensive plan for furthering diversity, equity, and inclusion at the school, including a robust recruitment and retention program for faculty and students from historically underrepresented in medical communities. He coordinates with such groups as the Diversity, Inclusion, Community Engagement and Equity, the Minority Organization for Retention and Expansion, the Committee on the Status of Women in, Sci Women in Medicine, the Committee on Diversity, Inclusion, and Social Justice, and the Dean's Advisory Council on LGBTQ Affairs. Please join me to welcome Dr. Lattimore. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, and I really appreciate the acknowledgement of where we are in, in society right now and the acknowledgement of Black Lives Matter. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, 
Dr. Nakai, I, I um, agree wholeheartedly that how we each experience being first generation low income, of which I am both, um, really varies from individual to individual. So I just want to tell you a little bit about myself because I think it will help you understand um, what I'm about to say. And I'm not going to talk long because I really want us to have time for um, questions and answers. So I grew up not as a deputy dean. I grew up in low income housing because my father had a heroin addiction and decided to rob a bank when I was seven years old and was drugged off to prison literally in front of me. And so I, my family and I had to move to low income housing. And then eventually my mother unfortunately ended up with a chronic medical condition and couldn't work at all. I started working at the age of 13 illegally in the summer, 14, 15, and got my real legitimate job at the age of 16. So society did not look at this person and say, that's a future doctor. Society didn't, and quite frankly, my family didn't either, because as was said earlier, I was working, and my family was depending on me to help supplement our income. I remember laughing because our whole house, our house income was less than my financial aid package from just me. I, my, I was trying to run our whole house on that amount of, less than that amount of money. So when I, when I went into undergraduate, again, I felt very isolated, very alone, because I didn't come from a family of physicians. I didn't come from a family of professional people at all, quite frankly. And um, I'm, I'm really glad to hear um, Dr. Rigney and her positive um, inspirational advice. I can guarantee you when I was in your shoes, I got none of that. I only was told about what I was not capable of and what um, I was never going to accomplish. So that's the Darren Lattimore who comes to you. So the first thing I'm going to say is, as a first generation low income, a lot of us do talk about our weaknesses and not our strengths, because society has, has reminded us of our weaknesses and not, has not reminded us of our strengths, and has led us to have imposter syndrome, quite frankly. Many of us do, are not proud of our humble beginnings. So the first thing that I would say to you is, if you're anything like I was, quite frankly, ashamed of who I was, when I was your age, I would never have rattled off my story just like I did. But that's where your strength comes from. That's where your resilience comes from. And quite frankly, it's probably why you are so dedicated to being a physician, because you want to make the people in your community's lives better. And so I, if, if I could say nothing, I would say before you even start this process, do that work because you've got to present yourself not just authentically, but you've got to present yourself with pride. And if you just present yourself as embarrassed and humble and don't want to tell your story, that's not going to help you in this process. The other thing that I'll say is many of us come from cultures that are humble. We talk in terms of we, we talk in terms of the collective. Unfortunately, in this process, that's not helpful. Um, I'm not telling you go out and boast, but I am saying when I read your application, I need to know what you contributed, what you innovated, what you led, what group of people you worked with. And if you're sounding too humble about it, again, which many of our cultures strongly advocate that, so that's why we do it, then it's very hard for me to tease that out in your application. Same thing when you're doing your interviews. Again, I'm not saying boast, but I am saying that you have to let go of some of that humility so I can actually know what you have contributed and what you have accomplished. The other thing that I would say that um, is very important is that all of your pack, part of your packages be um, to the best that they can be. So please, please get somebody to review your, um, your application. I don't care if English is your first language. Find somebody else to make sure that your personal statement has no grammatical or punctual errors, your disadvantage statement if you so choose to write one. Um, writing a disadvantage statement is a personal decision. Um, again, many people don't feel comfortable doing it. Um, because if you look around your community, you're just like the rest of them. You're not disadvantaged. Um, but if you're honest with yourself and compare yourself to the typical person who's in medical school who comes from a two-professional parent household, many of us are quite disadvantaged. 
The goal of a disadvantage statement is not to get someone to go boo hoo hoo, poor me. The goal of a disadvantage statement is again to let people understand the obstacles and your road traveled to get to where you are. When written well, can be quite helpful. When written poorly, cannot be so helpful. Help your letter writers out. Um, a lot of us didn't go to schools where there's a lot of people um, who are going to medical school. So they, our letter writers are not used to cranking out 50 of these letters a year. Um, so please, please, when you ask someone to write you a letter, bring them your um, personal statement. If you're going to do a disadvantage statement, bring them that, your activities. If you don't know the individual well, please, please go and talk to them. The letter, so you can't sound boastful. Your letter writer absolutely must boast about you. If your letter sounds like you're an average Joe Blow, that's not getting into medical school. That's actually going to hurt you. So the more that you can do to work with whoever is going to write your letter, again, I'm not telling anyone to falsify anything, but to really be a strong letter so that whoever reads it knows the writer really knows you, that really will help you. And unfortunately, I see this a lot from people who don't go to schools that crank out a lot of pre-meds or successful pre-meds, that their letters, relatively speaking, to um, institutions that crank out a lot of pre-meds are much more humble, shall we say. The next thing, yeah, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna just say two more things because we really do need to have time for you guys to have questions resources i saw a lot of chat about what is free assistance program if you don't know what that is before you apply for the mcat please please look it up it actually will buy down some of the cost of the mcat and it will buy down the some of the cost of how, the schools depending on how many schools you choose to apply to and at least the way it used to be if you apply to that you're automatically put on a list so those of our institutions that are proactively looking for diversity, we know you exist and can actually do some outreach to you. So um, again, I would strongly advocate that you do that before you even apply um, for medical school and that will help buy down some of your cost. The other thing I have to be honest, I really was poor. <laughs> um, so I had one trip I was doing to the East Coast. I had one trip I was doing to the Midwest. I was in California so I could drive around. And so I contacted every school that um, showed me any love on the East Coast and told them when I was going to be there. And the overwhelming majority of them worked with me. They were willing to move things around when I explained, I really can't afford to fly from California to the East Coast five or six separate times. And so I was able to literally rent a car and just do the whole East Coast in one shot to the whole Midwest that I was interested in, in one shot. And then California, again, was not that big of an issue. When it comes to secondaries, again, if economics is an issue, reach out to the school. Almost, most schools will waive that, but you have to let them know you need it waived. If you don't feel comfortable contacting the admissions office, then reach out to the diversity office. The same thing. If you cannot afford to go to an interview, please at least give the school the opportunity to fund you coming before you just don't go. They can, on the worst they can say is no, but you weren't going anyway because you didn't have the money anyway. So hopefully they will say yes. And again, if you don't feel comfortable talking to the admissions office, you can start with their diversity office and see if they have funding. At my institution, we quietly do this quite often. Um, and I anticipate many other schools, diversity offices do this quite often. The last thing I'm going to say, and it's not going to help you with actually getting into medical school, but apply for as many scholarships as possible to buy down your first year of medical school, because unfortunately, applying to medical school, no matter how you do it, is going to cost you money. You got to buy new clothes. You got to travel. You got to stay in hotels, et cetera, et cetera. So there is significant cost to this process, which creates incredible inequity, but we're not going to fix that today. Um, thank you so much again for inviting me. Um, why don't we open this up for questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Lattimore. Thank you for sharing your personal story. It's really helpful for us to, share, uh, to hear from your perspective. Um, 
thank you and thank you to uh, every one of our speakers for making time joining us today. We're going to open the floor for questions because we have many attendees for this session. We ask you to use the raise your hand button uh, if you wanted to speak up for your question uh, so that we can unmute you. Uh, please also feel free to submit your questions using the chat function. Uh, and we ask you to, dir uh, to direct the questions uh, directly to our board member, Mersal, uh, so then we can condense and maybe gather more um, questions and capture the theme of it, okay? All right, so, so I think there's a hand raised. I'm gonna unmute. I think you're unmuted. I, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you again, Dr. Lattimore, for sharing your story. And, uh, you know, it's really great to hear that other people went through similar situations. Um, and I guess I had a question specifically about the diversity, or not diversity supplement, the uh, disadvantage statement that you mentioned. Um, so I'm currently applying for it. Um, and it's a little bit vague on the MCAS side about what the, I guess like what the qualifications for it. So I guess from the medical school perspective, when you see disadvantage statements, is it something that the each school kind of signif or identifies the student as or, is it up to the interpretation of the medical schools to say if a student really is disadvantaged? And like, how does that process actually happen? Um, I, I think it's not like the fee assistance program where you either are or not. It's like up to the discretion of the medical schools, but that's not very clear through reading about it online. And I've had to do a lot of research to figure out what that process is. So I'm not sure you're talking about the fee assistance because that's purely economic, or if you're talking about the disadvantage statement for the actual AMCAS application. Yeah, the, the disadvantage statement. So the disadvantage statement, I want to be very clear. You, you label yourself, not us. You check the box on disadvantage uh -huh. or not. If you do, the sort of things that I look for in that statement is economic disadvantage, first generation, for, um, first um, to go to um, higher education, um, work yourself through college. If you had two jobs, at any given time or more, I don't care if it's for a day, you say that explicitly. Uh -huh. um, poor mentorship, you actually are acting as parents to your family members, grew up in an unstable environment, that could be your house itself, mm -hmm. or that can be the environment as a whole. Be clear, you did not hear me say my race. Mm -hmm. That is not a disadvantage statement. I need to know your path in life. Every race and ethnicity can have people who are disadvantaged and people who are privileged. Mm -hmm. um, some people will say, literally, I'm black, okay? I'm a migrant. I, you know, that's, you, you need to give me more of what were the true obstacles. You also, and I'm telling you to do this, but you may also choose if you had medical issues that led to a semester or two of your GPA going downward, you may want to use that space to actually articulate that also. So mm -hmm. that's part one. Part two, the schools, and each school has a criteria of how they interpret it and what they consider mm. disadvantaged. So they read your statement to see if it meets from their holistic view of disadvantage, if it does or doesn't. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, economics are the easiest for a person to wrap their brain around. So if you're economically disadvantaged, that tends to not take a whole lot of explanation. Um, other forms of disadvantage, which can be just as disabling or crippling, um, you may need to articulate a little bit better because every, a lot of the readers who come from very um, privileged backgrounds, it may not resonate as quickly. Mm -hmm. And Sunny, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I think that was perfect. Schools use it in different ways. The only thing is to describe how it impacted you and in factual ways. So like my family was on public assistance. I lived in public housing. I moved X number of times. Mm -hmm. I worked so many jobs. Not if I hadn't have had to work, I would have gotten straight A's, right? Like it's mm -hmm. not a crystal ball. Mm -hmm. It's just the state the facts and then how schools interpret that, as you said, Dr. Lenmore, is, is just up to them. If the reader reads it and they're doing the holistic review and they somehow don't think it was a disadvantage. Like, there's nothing that you can do about that. You just have to state the facts of how your mm -hmm. these obstacles or challenges have impacted your path, and then just let those mean whatever they mean at prospective schools. Mm -hmm. If you write it factually, it, it can't hurt you, right? I mean, mm -hmm. as long as you are um, respectful and factual in your approach. Do you think it's okay? 
I was just going to add one last thing. If you think it's okay to say, um, talk about your formative years, because that is when I experienced my biggest economic hardship was be before the ages of like 21 and under. Um, but then more recently, my family has kind of gotten a job and worked things out. So things are changing more recently, but obviously that doesn't undo all the public assistance, all the unemployment and all the uh, years of, you know, poverty of, that I went through. I'm so glad you asked the question, because if you actually look at the instructions, it says explicitly your childhood, um, but a lot of you don't actually read that part. And unfortunately, I think a lot of the people on the admissions team also don't look at that part. But that actually is the instructions, is your formative years. So um, we have a lot of questions in the chat and I don't think we will get to all of them. Um, for those of you that have asked questions that we can answer in the chat as this next panel goes on, I will make sure to get to your answers if I can, especially the ones that are about resources um, or um, things that we can, we can have sent to you. Um, I wanna be able to use the, the panelists and, and you know with, with all of their um, uh, experiences and knowledge um, as best as we can. I've gotten a lot of questions about just in general um, COVID and how um, that might affect uh, someone's application and the timing of applications. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, so um, a lot of people's MCATs are delayed due to COVID and we understand that. The download for National application is for schools to receive your application is moved forward by two weeks. So that means no one in the country can read an AMCAS application, no matter when it was submitted or verified, until at earliest July 10th. So um, that is sort of when we are going to start our admissions processes. So that means everything is going to be rolled forward. So if you think that you're going to have an MCAT score and be able to have your application be considered, um, Usually we say June and July. This year, I think it's gonna be more kind of July, August, but it's very school dependent as well. So I recommend um, if your resources are limited or you have the FAP, but you wanna make sure you apply strategically, um, you have an MCAT pending, you can um, apply to just one school that you're sure you really want to apply to no matter what. If you're not confident about what you might get on the MCAT, you could apply to a school that you're not very keen on. So you won't be you know, putting in an application um, somewhere where you might have to answer to be a reapplicant, um, and then submit your application for verification. And then you'll kind of be in the verification queue and be ready to go. And then when your MCAT score comes out, you can decide where you want to, to send it. You can call the school and say, I just got my MCAT score today. Is it too late to apply? How much consideration will I receive if I send it now? And try and manage it that way rather than sending it out to everyone and then hoping that it gets some consideration. I think most schools are going to extend, you know, review period consideration due to the pandemic and knowing that the MCAT scores are, are very delayed this year. I'm happy to follow up with that on, um, on the chats this weekend if anybody wants to join. I'm sure it's kind of the biggest thing on everyone's mind. So we, we can take one of the, um raised hands and the questions, a lot of the questions in the chat, I think might be better directed, how to pay for school, things like that might be better directed for the medical students in the next panel. Um, and a lot of these questions, we'll send out links and we'll um, send out more information. Joanna, do you wanna take someone with a raised hand? Sure, I don't, so I'm having trouble seeing who actually raised hand. Can any of the co-hosts? Yes, so we have Diane and Sydney. Do you want me to unmute one? Yes, please. Okay, I will unmute one. Okay, you are free to talk. Hello, I wanted to say thank you again for the really informative panel. I feel really uh, seen and heard through the advisors and I appreciate that. My question is for people who are planning on applying and the whole thing about reaching out to admissions officials at schools that you're interested in, how do you go about having that conversation? Because some schools say, don't call us, we don't, ha we don't offer any advice for anyone. But at the same time, I feel like if you want to sort of explain your situation and or see if it will be like 
actually considered for an interview, that's something that you have to do. You just have to hear it from them. So like, I was just wondering the best practices for doing that. Do you want me to take that one? <laughs> um, so I do think that you have to follow the guidelines that the schools set forth. Um, this is where some med students who might be willing to support through, you know, things like FlyMed can offer advice about how they approach to various schools. Um, as Dr. Um, as Dean Rigney said, you can use the MSAR to kind of approximate what kind of consideration you might receive and look at that plus the timing of your application and, and try to get a sense. And as Dr. Lattimore said, contact the diversity office and they might be able to give you some idea um, of are you within range for consideration. And um, the way to ask the question is, um, will I receive strong consideration for an interview, right? Because you're really asking for consideration. It's not like, do you think I'm gonna get an interview? And remember admissions people don't wanna say over the phone, that sounds good because they're worried about their words being misinterpreted or overreaching. Like we have to say may or might or could or, you know, like temper our language, not like, oh yeah, that sounds good. That's within interview range. And then an applicant walks away saying, oh, I'll get an interview. And then it comes back on us that, you know, we've communicated something in a way that um, is ambiguous or misleading. So I think that's the reluctance on the admission side is just, we don't want to be misinterpreted or misunderstood. And, you know, I've been a dean that had to get through almost 16,000 applications for 175 seats. It's really daunting, you know, to try and, you know, let people know what your ranges are and um, where that consideration is. So I do think try and reach out and find out how much consideration your application will receive so you can say, is it, you know, is it really worth applying to this school? And how the schools treat you in admissions is, can be somewhat indicative of what your experience might be as a student as well. If they're really dismissive, um, maybe that's not a good educational environment either. Um, I feel compelled. Someone asked questions about, should I talk about mental health issues in my application? And, and, I, and I think that's a, a real um, difficulty for any individual person to decide. This would be something I would really talk to an advisor that you really trust, knows you and you feel has your back as to um, if it adds to your story so people understand again if there was something that helps explain a bad semester that is now under control and now your, your grades have gone back up. That's one thing. Um, others may have, uh, on the panel, may have an opinion, um, but I would definitely, definitely, um, before I sent it in, make sure that the wording, the tone, um, is something that's gonna land well. To, to others um, on the panel, um, have advice for, do you talk about mental health in your application? I can talk a little bit about that. I would agree with you, Dr. Lattimore, that if there's something to explain in the application, like a break from school, if you had to take a medical leave of absence for some reason, or you took some time away to deal with your illness, and then you come back and have a really strong um, performance since then, and you feel that your mental health issue and your, your recovery from your illness or your coping with your illness has really motivated you to choose medicine uh, and that you feel that that illness helps you to empathize better with patients, then I think that you know that's a decision that you make, but you don't want it to be the only thing that um, admissions committees uh, you know, sort of take away from your application. So you don't want it to be completely dominant of your personal statement, let's say. You want to see other aspects of you. Um, but I have certainly worked with students who it's really central to how they see their future in medicine and, and how they will work with patients. And, I, and again, I think that from the admissions committee's perspective or the medical school's perspective, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you want to be assured that the illness is controlled and that you can perform. Um, and so having that performance post illness is really helpful and important to show that you've learned those coping mechanisms. But I think, you know, the other, the other reality is, is that many medical students do um, experience depression. It's very real um, in adolescent and early adulthood. And so in some ways it can be an asset to say, I know 
this vulnerability and I've learned how to cope and I've learned how to ask for help and I'm in counseling or I take medication or what have you because it, you know it's just it's an illness and the hope is that that you know you've learned how to manage your illness um, and, and so that's that, that's how I've often advised students. Thank you so much Dean Rigney uh, and Dr. Lattimore. Uh, I am so sorry, but we're running a little bit behind. Uh, we need to wrap this panel up. Uh, for those of you who still have questions, we are going to have a student panel uh, in the next hour. So hopefully your questions may be addressed in that panel as well. Um, so please join me to thank all of our speakers again for their time and their insights. Um, we really appreciate that you, were be, you are able to join us today. Um, and... Thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna take a five minute break before our next student panel. So we're gonna be back on um, the 12th, uh, the tw uh, it will be, yeah, we're gonna be back in five minutes. Um, so yeah, go get some water to the restroom. I'll see you guys soon.